Art of Possibilities Beyond Planet Earth. My name is Karen Ng, and I'm a freelance writer and editor, and I work with TED.com. Normally, we tend to think of space exploration as being a job for a scientific elite driven by government, but this afternoon, we want to think about how the rest of us can play a role. We're speaking to three artists working in the field of space exploration and an astronaut in training to find out how and why they're helping humanity, ordinary people like you and me, to imagine life in outer space. So let me introduce each of them, and then they will each give a short presentation. We'll have a panel discussion and then open up the floor for questions. Space systems researcher and artist Angela Vermoylen works on starship design and leads community builds of starship prototypes. Angelo has worked with the European Space Agency, and in 2013, he was crew commander of the NASA-funded Mars simulation, researching food to sustain human life on Mars. Angelo. Frederick de Wilde here is known for his Black is Black art project, collaborating with Rice University and NASA to produce the world's blackest material using carbon nanotubes. He's taking his art to the moon next year in collaboration with Carnegie Mellon University, SpaceX, and Astro Robotic. Artist Jorge Manes Rubio is collaborating with the European Space Agency on a new art project, building a temple on the south pole of the moon. He's looking at space exploration from a human, anthropological, and spiritual perspective. And finally, Mandla Maseko is a fighter pilot and South African astronaut who aspires to be the first African to walk on the moon. In 2015, he won a seat on an hour-long suborbital trip from the Axe Apollo Space Academy. This is a privately funded project uh, launching young men and women into space, and some of these will make history as the first from their nations to go to space. So we're going to start with Angelo. Which one looks? Yeah. All right. Oh, the file name is on my slides, wonderful. Um, hello everyone, I'm briefly gonna introduce you to my work, which is a bit of a mix of art and science. What you can see here is one of the art projects that I've been working on for about 10 years now. I have a background in biology and I create installation art. And what you see here is actually a computer network built out of e-waste, recycled computers, and then a living ecosystem of plants inside of the network that uses the waste heat of the electronics to grow and develop. And the project is called Biomod. Now, typically for the projects that I've been doing recently, over the, like over the past 10 years, is that I'm working, uh, I'm using co-creation. I'm working with groups of people. And the projects that are built are actually built without a plan. They're built bottom up. Even though they're very complex, we build, we start with a rough concept, just like the Biomod concept, the one I explained to you, old computers, ecosystem inside, and then the community, the local community shapes it, like this one in Taiwan. Because of this work, which had this, has this kind of futuristic qualities, I got invited by the European Space Agency to collaborate with them, and with a particular research group, which is called Melissa. And the Melissa Research Group is actually developing a regenerative ecosystem for future space colonization. It's an ecosystem that recycles every single molecule that comes out of your body. Toilet waste, CO2, breaks all the molecules down, turns them into food for plants, and then the plants produce food and oxygen for the astronauts. This propelled me into the world of space exploration and ended up working for NASA. This was a big experience. In 2013, I was the crew commander of the first High Seas mission. High Seas is a NASA-funded research program that investigates the effects of long-term isolation on very small crews. And I lived in this, uh, in this dome, which you can see in some of the photos, for four months, locked up with five other people practicing life on Mars. One of the main studies we did, just like Karen already introduced, was an extensive food study to develop new food systems for future uh, space habitation on places like Mars and the Moon. Now, all of this led me to, uh, basically to question our future in outer space, but much more beyond, uh, much more beyond Mars and the Moon. And I got really interested in interstellar space. And I basically, I'm currently working on uh, interstellar travel, and that's my, my current research, both in art and in science. Seeker is a project in which I prototype starships with communities all over the world using the same co-creation methodology that I've already explained in the Biomod project. And a starship is really interesting because it really invites communities to rethink the world. A starship is a, a self-contained system in which you have to discuss how people live together, governance, ecology, material res uh, resource usage, etc. And so we've been doing this in different locations, and in each location it gets a bit of a different shape, once again determined by local interests and local concerns. 
uh, we also built the interior of the starships. It's not just building, um, building shells, but we really build systems that are kind of operational on many different levels. This is an example of how we built the same concept in Holland, where people love caravans. So we used caravans to build starships. We cut them to pieces and put them together again to build kind of interesting architectures. And crucially in the project, we actually test what we built. It's not just talking and, and prototyping something. We actually live inside. We lock ourselves up inside, sometimes inside a museum, and then we test our, uh, yeah, our, our artwork, basically. And then to conclude, all of this led me to my current research at Delft, University of Technology, where I'm doing a PhD specifically on the design of starships, and I'm basically combining biology and space engineering, and I'm working on concepts for starships that are over time developing, developing themselves during their interstellar journey. And that basically concludes my short presentation. Um, Frederick? Yeah. Next. Just checking if it works. Ah, perfect. Yeah. So, hello everybody. My name is Frederik. Uh, I'm an artist working at the interface of art, science, uh, and technology. It's going to be a little bit of a roller coaster. We only have five minutes. It was actually scheduled ten, five minutes. So I will talk a little bit about space and the projects I'm doing, but in the broad sense. So it's not only about outer space, but you know, you guys, you will see. So, uh, in general, uh, I'm going to skip this kind of thing because we don't have time for this. Uh, but my praxis is not only making art, I do also some developing of software. There's some consultancy freelance jobs, but I'm going to spare you the PR. Um, so let's skip this. There's also a writing of publications, so I'm also an essayist. So this one was about deep learning in a cinematic space, combining, um, you know, thinking about art and ethics, in this uh, specific case about cinema and artificial intelligence. Um, so these things I'm doing. Uh, one of the projects uh, I've been working on also quite a long time is thinking how we can hack into the universe. Um, and it deals with art, but also uh, quantum physics and, uh, and so on and so on. This concluded in a paper which was published um, by uh, Amsterdam University Press and so on. And um, it stems from an experiment we did with the uh, uh, Quantum Teleportation Communication and Encryption Lab in Australia. Uh, and we did a kind of, yeah, quite groundbreaking experiment. Um, so basically, uh, we have taken um, signals out of the quantum vacuum, okay? So the classic vacuum is you take a globe, you suck out all the oxygen, and it's empty. But in fact, if you look at a subatomic level, it's full of life. Think about it as a glass of champagne with a lot of bubbles. So it's full of energy. So basically, you have virtual particle pairs that are destroying each other in a very, very short moment of time. So you have matter and antimatter. But you can pull out energy and information out of that. This is really interesting for information technology, climate prediction, traffic control, gaming, and so on and so on, because we need true random numbers, not only uh, generated random numbers, but really random numbers. Uh, I try to translate that kind of stuff into physical shapes, so by 3D printing. So you, hear, uh, you see some artistic uh, explorations of the quantum vacuum. Uh, I 3D print them, like here, you see uh, one of the, the shapes. Um, make also some videos with it, it's almost like expanded cinema, I would say, there is no sound. Maybe you can, no, no sound. Okay, oh, there we go. So you can see this stuff online, I'm not going to show it too much, but this is a real-time uh, data visualization of these quantum uh, fluctuation measurements, okay? Because I do think it's important to, uh, to try to visualize something which is that complex and that intangible. Um, one of the projects, and it was briefly discussed, is about bringing art to the moon. So this is one of the projects with uh, 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 Carnegie Mellon and so on and so on. 
Uh, and it started actually with uh, the idea how can you create an internet of things and also a sculpture uh, on the moon. But it cannot be just a sculpture, right? It has to do something with the physicality of the moon. That means no atmosphere, um, strong um, uh, infrared and UV light and so on and so on. So basically I wanted to work with uh, light sensitive polymers and use that to grow the sculpture and implement sensors. So this was purely hypothetical in the beginning, um, but I continued to work on it. I believe that this nation um, we probably won't have time to see the video completely, Before unfortunately. Out, landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. And this is actually a hot topic right now for ESA, NASA, and so on. Can we work with Regolith? Can we 3D print with the materials there? Do we, you know, the only thing we need to ship is maybe resins, uh, and so on and so on. So I tried to implement that in my artistic praxis. It became also a, a publication, which is a little bit more academic. Um, I don't know how much time I still have. A couple minutes. Two minutes? OK. So one of the projects uh, is also the Black is Black. Of course, it deals also with space, because basically what you're researching is the nature of nothingness. When you try to produce something which is blacker than black, uh, it's really something paradoxical, because you have to add something to see nothing. And basically, you have to grow it from almost like atomic-sized particles. So you do it with uh, ion sputtering, chemical vapor deposition, and so on and so on. So, uh, how to grow the black as black, because a lot of people ask me this. Um, so, it's basically carbon nanotubes, but we start actually with a silicon wafer in general. We uh, put that in an ion sputtering machine, which you see there. So, we vaporize uh, atoms, let's say iron, from a source material, which is 99.9% .9 pure, like iron or gold. So, these atoms are vaporized on top of the substrate. We put it in a chemical vapor deposition uh, oven. It's almost like an oven. You have a high temperature, and suddenly there is this interaction of these particles with a feedstock of gas, which is uh, most likely ethylene, which contains a, a, a feedstock of carbon molecules. It interacts, and you grow this black stuff. So basically, it looks like this. Uh, so in the top image is a scanning electron microscope image, actually all of them. And here it's quite straight, but if you look deeper or more uh, close, you see it's almost like spaghetti, like spirelli, okay? And actually, how we create the black as black is to, with, um, how you can imagine it? Okay, you have a camera obscura box. You know, you have a shoe box and you put a little hole in there. Light is quantized, so we know it's a ping pong ball, and this ping pong ball goes through the little hole in the box. Now, the chance that this ping pong ball finds its way out is almost zero. So you capture all light under the surface. Nothing can resurface again. Uh, plus the fact that the material is very pure, it's very pure carbon, um, makes it even blacker. And if you want to diffuse the light in all directions, uh, which you can do with nanowires, which you see there on top, you create even a black from all the angles you look at it. So it's a very complicated process, but it's really interesting. I'm interested in that stuff for art, but uh, NASA for coding of uh, space telescopes for stray light suppression. There are many applications, okay? So this started all in 2008. Finally, I made some bigger pieces with it, inspired by, of course, Yves Klein and Yves Klein Blue, his ideas about the void and the concepts. Oh, one minute, okay, I have to speed up. So I'm gonna skip a few slides, but basically this project connects uh, the beginning of man, the cave drawings, which is with charcoal, to space, and for instance, the space elevator. So there was in 1895, Konstantin Tchaikovsky, he was a Russian scientist, he went to Paris, saw the Eiffel Tower, and he said like, wow, if we can grow that in space, that would be just amazing. And that was the beginning of the concept of the space elevator. And I still believe it's the only way to democratize space for everybody, okay? And the only material that it can be made with is none diamond thread or the carbon nanotubes that I'm working with. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm also doing some educational work. Yeah, I have to round up. So with Aztec, uh, Angelo knows it really well. So I think, and here I'm going to conclude, when I talk about space, I think it's even more important to talk about space, what it can learn us here right now. Because if we think about people in extreme conditions, like in outer space, and we allow people to reflect on it, on our ecology here on Earth, we can really advance things. So what it learns us here right now is much more important. I'm just going to continue. 
Uh, Wait, no, stop. I have to stop. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to stop. <laughs> the boss has decided. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Jorge? Yeah. Thanks. You didn't start the timer yet, right? No. I want my full five minutes. Oh, damn it. I'm watching you. All right. So um, last year, I went to the south of Japan. And um, I came across one of the most unbelievable stories I've ever heard. That's the story of Akitoshi Fujiyama, who was uh, an engineer. Uh, working for Ube Industries, and back in the 70s, he stumbled upon a lunar meteorite. And this was an event that uh, launched him on a lifelong quest that uh, affected his family, his village, his nation, and potentially the entire planet. He decided to go to the moon, and he spent his entire life trying to make this dream, uh, this dream possible. So, for example, the more I started to dig into this story and talking to locals, the more I got fascinated by his story. Uh, for example, he got this abandoned pachinko nearby his village, and he transformed it into a secret space mission control. Oh. Damn it. That's right. So this is the abandoned pachinko place, and he transformed it into a uh, secret space mission control room that's still standing there. Uh, so I decided around that time to create an art exhibition at AAV Art Museum in Japan that revolved around this unknown local hero. So for example, he was working for Ube Industries, right? And that's one of the largest industrial corporations in Japan. And he, asked, he had access to very interesting materials. Uh, the golden fold that you see here is called UPLEX, and it's an aerospace material that is still in use today to protect astronauts, spaceships, and satellites against galactic cosmic rays. Um, Akitoshi never in his entire life left Japan, but he was very afraid of feeling homesick once he was up there. So he created this kind of furniture that I think is very interesting because it kind of uh, beautifully merges what's the uh, Japanese traditional craftsmanship together with um, some sort of a, a futuristic function. This might be the furniture we'll be using in the future when we leave planet Earth. Uh, I was also lucky to photograph his wife, um, Akiko, who was practicing Ikebana next to the cosmic biobu at her place. And uh, of course, part of the exhibition was the infamous lunar meteorite, Ube 064. And it's important to say that Akitoshi wanted to go to the moon, but not for exploration's sake. He had plans to come back to Earth with many of these moon rocks and starting a very profitable business uh, back in his village in Japan. So to honor his idea, what I created were these vending machines where people for only 100 yen, they could purchase their very own lunar meteorites. And they were sold within minutes, actually. Akitoshi spent many years working on his lunar maps. What you see here is a geologic map of the moon. And these maps help him to kind of track down exactly where, what materials he could find. He was looking for the most precious and the most valuable materials. So in the last tribute, I placed this map on top of a truck from Ube Industries, the company he used to work for. And then this truck set up on a private highway that is actually Japan's largest, uh, longest private highway. And uh, these trucks, they transport natural resources pretty much 24 hours a day. So we were kind of imagining how these highways in the future might connect our planet with the moon or with an asteroid or even some other planets. So after this project, I kind of uh, uh, I saw the moon from a completely different perspective, and I understood how important it is the future colonization and exploitation of celestial bodies. So I came back to Amsterdam, where I'm based, and I got in touch with the European Space Agency, and I convinced them of the need that they had to start an official artist in residence program. And I told them I would help them with the condition that I would be the first one, and that's how I am today, artist in residence at the European Space Agency. And this is a headline that some of you might have 
have seen plans to build a moon village. And I'm interested in all the technicalities, but most of it, once we have a civilization that is permanent and self-sustainable on the moon, what sort of rituals, what sort of culture, uh, cultural artifacts, what sort of art or monuments are going to be developed, not by us, but by this civilization. So I started asking questions, you know, how can you build things on the moon, uh, what's possible, what's not possible. And like we, like we talked before, uh, now we're working on these 3D printing robots that are able to 3D print using lunar regolith. And they're able to 3D print not only small objects, but entire buildings. So that led me to the question of architecture on the moon. What is architecture going to look like on the moon? And somebody at ESA told me, you know, the most similar thing here on planet Earth is Adobe architecture, which I think is a very cool answer because Adobe is super primitive. We've been using Adobe for thousands of years to build our homes. This is, for example, a mosque in Ghana, and this is a 14th century Sudanese Adobe architecture. Uh, but Adobe architecture is not only a thing for the past. Uh, we're, for example, in Iran, is being used uh, uh, widely around the country to build very affordable and sustainable and easy to build homes. So that's exactly what you need on the moon. Now. Take a look at this image. This is Newton's cenotaph. And, and don't Google map it, because it was never built. But it was, it was designed by Etienne de Boulet, who's the father of utopian architecture uh, back in the 18th century. And this building was too massive and too, too big and just way too heavy to be ever built. This will collapse on itself. But what's interesting is that with one six of Earth's gravity on the moon, Someday, maybe Boulet's dreams could become possible. And now, think about that for a minute, and don't apply it only for architecture, but apply it to every single element that constitutes a new civilization. This could be a chance for a tabula rasa for a new civilization, right? So look at this image, for example. I kind of uh, you know, miss this sort of spiritual connection that we have with the cosmos. This is El Caracol. It's a pre-Columbian Mayan temple in Chichen Itza, Mexico. And this was a temple, but this was also an observatory, one of the first observatories, actually. So back in that time, a temple and an observatory were exactly the same. And somewhere along the way, we missed that reverence and that connection with nature and with the cosmos and with the heavenly bodies. And I want that connection back. So interestingly, the more I look into the future of space civilization, the more I look into the early and more primitive ones and, and think about how can we add a bit more of a spiritual dimension or mythological dimension or human dimension into space exploration or into science. I think the answer is art, uh, because art installations like this one, this is Walter de Maria in Naoshima, Japan, these are the temples of the 21st century, I believe. And art is the universal language that can bring that spiritual and uh, that scientific world together. So I'm um, finishing here. The moon, unlike Earth, it has no divisions, no boundaries, and, and no nations. And that's a very powerful symbol of unity. So I'm currently working on proposing a temple for the South Pole of the Moon. And I'm going to stop you right there, because the temple doesn't answer to any religion whatsoever. It doesn't even matter what your idea of religion is. This is a temple that will celebrate the moon and our relationship with the moon that we have for thousands of years. And it will celebrate that, that mythical and that universal idea. Now think about colonizing the moon as the best shot we'll ever get to redefine what will be the most important values for a future civilization, not only in our space, but also here on planet Earth. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you this short video. That was too short. <laughs> okay.
Let's try that again. So this is the moment when we find out who has won the ultimate prize. This is when we find out who is going into space. Our first winner. From India, Vine Singh. The next winner. Tale Sunli Sefer of Norway. Next winner, Daniel Chino Roque from the Philippines. I'm extremely apprehensive and anxious. The buzz in Egypt has reached like a really big level, and I'm hoping not to let everybody down. Following Chino, Amos Fogg from New Zealand. We were all watching. And I was like, ah, <laughs> I just couldn't handle it. From Spain, Eduardo Loreña. <laughs> next winner, Omar Sampa. My destiny at this point is in the hands of the judges. Of course, fingers crossed. I wanna. I've been working at this so long that I, I hope the judges see that. From Russia, Dini Efremov. <laughs> From Germany, Felix Scott. <laughs> From Thailand, Miss Parada Sakavigi. It was happening so fast. Bang Long Lu from Vietnam. But the possibility is still there, and you're like so close to it. Our next winner from France, Ciro Gagne. <laughs> from Brazil, Marco Garazzi. Takanobu Yoneya from Japan. Right now, I'm out scared. From Slovakia, but Roca. even if I don't win, when you sit back and reflect, You'd say, I went up against the best, you know. OK, our last two. But I'm playing this whole thing in my head. The hands start sweating. I'm thinking, like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Tim Gibson from Australia. <laughs> and last but not least. Manling Kosi Maseko of South Africa. Congratulations to all of you. <laughs> so it was the 5th of December 2013 when the late great Nelson Mandela passed on. And three hours later, that happened. And that to me was a deep moment because it sort of felt like he was passing on the torch to me saying, here you go, go out there and be the one who brings about hope and change, not only to the youth of South Africa, but Africa as a whole. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mandla Maseko, and I will be the first black South African in space. So I'm part of other 22 hopefuls that will be launching into space uh, through a company called Xcore Aerospace as they are taking it further, higher, and faster. Xcore wants to make space accessible to ordinary people like me and you, which is to commercialize it. And I will be launching with a shuttle called the Lynx Mark II, and its flight plan is like this. It's gonna take off from a runway, like a normal plane, and immediately after it takes off, it ascends vertically, traveling at a speed of Mach 3, and in T minus six minutes, I will be in outer space. And after spending some few minutes looking at the Earth, you come back for the re-entry, then they glide, and then you land on the runway like a normal plane. That is the future of space travel. I guess that's the art of possibilities beyond Earth. 
Um, I'm going to scroll through the other slides because there's no time. I understand that I got this opportunity through a competition, but I also understand what a big privilege and an honor this is for me, which is why I had started a CSI campaign called Sky is Not the Limit, where I've partnered with the Department of Science and Technology and our own South African National Space Agency. What happens is that Every time they've got a space outreach or space program, um, any awareness that has to do with space, science, and technology, I get to become the part of that. So with that being said, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Um, so we'll have a little bit of a group discussion. Um, so. The first thing I want to ask is, until fairly recently, space exploration was considered the job of government and academic institutions. Um, how does your work bridge the gap between science and ordinary people who might want to think about taking a role in space exploration, and why is giving this access important? Does so anybody want to address that? Um, well, I think uh, space exploration has been in our mind for you know thousands of years. Every different civilization, you know, has some special relationship, and we have the same myths. And I think it's important that we keep it that way, and that for most of the people, it should be more than going to the cinema and watching science fiction movies. And uh, you know, artists can can engage into this new era of space exploration, but also. Uh, you know, writers and, and, and lawyers and experts in international cooperation and experts in economics and, and biology and many other fields. So I would like that, you know, to see someday that we are all involved and not only the richest, most powerful and widest people are going to go there, you know? Angela, do you want to talk about your secret project and how you get local communities to address some of their own issues on Earth in their spaceship designs? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, well, what happens with a project like Seeker is, and I've heard a few of you, um, I, mean, I think we all agree on that, that uh, investigating space is not just asking questions about space and finding solutions for space, but it always goes back to Earth. I think this is, there is no uh, question about that. Um, and so what we try to do is... Um, like I said in my presentation, we look at a starship as a beautiful metaphor because it is a, a self-containing system and it really challenges people to step out of their, um, out of their comfort zone out of their typical kind of imagination. I always tell people, like, it's very different if you um, address a community and you ask them, you give them the challenge, let's think about the house of the future half of your audience already falls asleep because it's not so exciting. But if you ask them, let's design a starship, people's imagination is immediately triggered. And this happens because mentally they reposition themselves outside of Earth and they leave behind a lot of assumptions and there is an openness that emerges. And I think from that openness we can re-envision both uh, solutions for Earth and space. And that's what comes out of a lot of these projects. So, um, and then just to conclude, um, the isolation missions are very crucial for the project. So, um, for example, in Slovenia we had an isolation mission and one of the people in uh, um, the spaceship that also designed the spaceship actually fought in the uh, in the war in Yugoslavia, and we were discussing discussing governance and the problem of military governments that is so military governance that is so typical for space exploration. And he started talking from his own perspective and the problems in the military, and it was a, an incredible moving uh, moving conversation that we had while we were doing while we were running our script of living in the future. Mm -hmm. How about you, Mandla? Would you like to address the question about how your work bridges the gap between ordinary people who might be interested in space exploration in a way they couldn't have done before? Um, you know, I think space exploration, um, these endeavors that push the human spirit forward, it's these endeavors that, how do I put it? It's these endeavors that make sure that they break boundaries. And if you can break these limits and boundaries in 100 people and then 1,000 people and break these limits and boundaries in 100,000 people, then I believe that we can create a shift in the entire generation. Um, for the artists in, in the group, I'm curious, why are space agencies so interested in working with artists like you? What is actually in it for them to fund your crazy visionary work? Can you address that? 
Um, well, it also depends with whom you're working with, right? Because everybody has probably a specific interest, so it's very difficult to, to tackle it from that perspective. Um, but I love the fact that it is a kind of mise en abîme space. I mean, you can imagine the ocean of potentialities which are possible doing there, but the more you get into it, the more you discover how limited you are, actually. And that, again, creates other challenges. So, for instance, um, because I just did a workshop with the people uh, with art science interfaculty uh, in Den Haag, which has a collaboration with Estec in Noordwijk, which is the, so Estec is the technical heart of ESA. To, by the way, I think Angelo also visited Estec uh, many times. Uh, and it's, it's incredible to see uh, youngsters and, and so on and so on involved in such a kind of thing and imagine, you know, with a blank slate what they could do. And as Angelo also stressed out, and, and, I, and I think it's, it's absolutely true, that the more you think about it, uh, the more you think about Earth. You know, and, and what you, how you can apply it here, and what, also spiritually, you know, how it changes your vision. And so here I can, can say a few things about, you know, Albert Camus said once, uh, L'homme naît et meurt et nous sommes pas heureux. So we are born and we die and we are not happy. And I think there is something true in there. I mean, we are born here, we die, but we are not happy. We feel at home, but not really at home. We feel also a little bit unheimly here. <laughs> and, and that actually pushes our, uh, us as a species, I think, also further into space exploration because we are curious. We actually, whatever you're doing here, whether you're CEO or whatever, you've been a child. Everybody has been a child, you know, and this is the core. Uh, everybody dreams about what's there, what's there to discover. Uh, and I think this is vital, this is vital. And as an artist, uh, okay, yeah. and then you can kill me uh, with all the quotes uh, uh, or say like it's enough. But there, Nietzsche, for instance, said like, um, no artist uh, um, accepts reality. And I think this is also something really which, which is inherent to artists. You know, you don't accept reality. You keep on imagining how it could be different. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you try to test it out. And then it's interesting also to work with scientists or be at the interface of art, science, technology, because you also in, 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 in incorporate uh, uh, scientific methodologies at a certain point, because you're, you're just in the process. So you're going to check it out. You're going to try if it's possible, and so on and so on. So yeah, that's a little bit my. Yeah. Sorry, no, no, no. I, have, I have some very specific observations on why the space industry and why space scientists are interested um, to work with artists. Uh, the first one is that it's it's this space is this obviously this huge unknown, um, but of course all the solutions we have and the knowledge we have is based on on problems that we have faced in the past. So because of this, this, this need for completely new approaches, it's really good to have an artist in the team or, ex or actually to collaborate with artists. It's, it's a question of innovation. There is no way around. JPL specifically has an artist lab in which um, the leader of the lab is sometimes inviting uh, people, engineers, to do troubleshooting. And they use a different approach than a typical engineering approach. They set up kind of a, an artistic research practice to come up with novel solutions. So there is definitely a, a big importance there on, 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 re on envisioning the future beyond your own specialized field, because all people in space industry are hyper-specialized often. And the second thing is what I noticed is when I make art that is inspired by the work of space scientists, that they... Um, it, and they have this surprise, of course, because suddenly they see their work displayed in a very different way, and it taps into their deep passions, which honestly sometimes gets buried in institutions like ESA and NASA. I mean, they're wonderful institutions for all the things they do, but they also have the, the disadvantage of being somewhat bureaucratic. And people working there sometimes are burdened in, in files and in applications and in figures and budgets, and then seeing the artwork brings them back to this original drive that why they started uh, to work on space and, I, and I've had these conversations with them about this and I think also sometimes uh, artists are allowed to be a kind of catalyst for failure or also an excuse for failure because generally it's not accepted but if an artist is involved you know you have a kind of scapegoat I mean that sounds a little bit pejorative a little bit negative but it is in a way you know, and uh, I, I think it's a good thing in a way. In the end, it's a good thing for everybody. It's a win-win. Um, <clears throat> um, well, back at home in South Africa, I think there is an interest in space. And I think that is driven by the awareness of the ministry 
um, that is caused by technology and science. And the reason why they partner with artists is because they want to create that awareness that actually there is something that is called space exploration. Mm -hmm. um, Jorge, can you talk about what, what does NASA say when you say you want to build a temple on the south pole of the moon? What, what, people what, do, what do people at NASA say when you say I'm going to build a temple on the south pole of the moon? Do they ever ask you um, what purpose will that serve? What well, a, a lot of people at ESA asked me to replace the name temple for something else. And, uh, and that's a condition that I didn't want to negotiate because uh, obviously we kind of uh, use the word temple and we suddenly think about religion. And uh, obviously, especially the big you know, Western religions have failed to keep up with, with our lifestyle today. But uh, I do think that uh, it's important to add that kind of a human or, or spiritual you know, dimension into the future of, uh, of space, uh, space uh, exploration. Of course, I think it doesn't really, uh, it's not a pressing subject to be the temple on the moon today, right? And uh, I don't really think it matters if that temple ever gets built or not. What it really matters is that it's going to start some series of conversations about, you know, what sort of, uh, um, yeah, what sort of factors are going to be implemented into this, this future civilization. That's the way I see it. Uh, the same with Angela, you know, I would love to see the spaceships flying, but I think that's, that's really not the point. And the point is that we learn today how to kind of uh, navigate through through our current civilization because we can learn a lot from from you know space exploration in terms of the the level of effort and and cooperation that is needed but um obviously you you keep on talking about colonizing places and you keep on talking about using natural resources and i think it's important that we look into the future which is very fascinating but i think it's also very important that we look back at history and and you know our history of colonization uh, and you know aggressive exploitation of of, uh, of natural resources and it's important that we that we also learn from that because we we hear the word colonization and we think we're talking about columbus 500 years ago but it's happening right now in in uh, dakota access, access pipeline for example mm -hmm. so yeah i I have, a, I have a question do you envision a separate culture evolving in places like the moon and mars and slowly diverging away from earth would you could you envision that I would like to think about that. Um, you know, the, the the temple, for example, is designed in a way that for two weeks you have visually con visual contact with Earth, and for an, another two weeks you you won't see Earth at all. What I'm trying to say is that when somebody is born uh, out of planet Earth for the very first time, uh, like on the Moon, what sort of culture and what sort of values are you gonna give to that person? The same way with somebody dies on the Moon, what sort of burial ritual are you gonna create? These are questions that, f for me, I find very interesting because I hope they trigger more interest into our, you know, very very rich infinity of nations and cultures and civilizations. And we need to see that, you know, we're all coming from the same place. And that's, I believe, that's what's the the most powerful uh, vision that most astronauts say when they see when they look at planet Earth and they understand that it's so fragile and that we all come from the same place. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I hope that we could appreciate all the different civilizations and we, we go out there not, not for my nation or for my proud, but we go out there representing, you know, representing us all. What do you think? Do you think we'll have a, a, a separate civilization somewhere? Yeah, I think this will happen <laughs> for sure. Yeah, yes. there's there's, in, there's interesting science fiction currently uh, being written and being shown on on, on and TV shows. Um, but I think that's definitely going to be a challenge for the future when people, exactly what you say, when humanity moves into outer space, it's called the post-planetary condition, where living on a planetary surface, on a spherical surface, is just one option for humanity. I think it's going to be really tricky to keep everything together and to keep to keep uh, to keep us. I mean, if you look at the world right now, I mean. This is, we run the risk of reproducing the same thing when we live throughout the solar system. And then it's going to be really interesting what kind of conflicts and how those conflicts are going to be, what kind of conflicts arise and how those conflicts are going to be um, uh, resolved. And I think the conflicts are probably going to be about resources because the resources throughout the solar system are extremely unequally distributed like they are on Earth. 
and this will generate all kinds of uh, tensions. So I am not like, you know, I don't have this pink picture about the future in our space. I do foresee that we will have to challenge, uh, to, to face these challenges. We've also talked about, um, we, we talked about the fact that the reason why we're all racing to go to space is not just because, not for the beauty of exploration, because, but because we want the resources for ourselves. We've talked a lot today about how we've overused the resources of Earth and destroying this planet, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna go to space and, continue to the path of destruction. But not only that, but who gets to go to space? At the moment, um, the, with privatization of space travel, we're th looking at people who have the money and, the, and ethnically those tend to be white men. And we've talked about, um, you know, who, we need to have a conversation about who gets to go to space, why, and who gets to benefit from it. And right now it's mostly white men who go to space and who design everything. Luckily, it starts changing. So I'm, yes. I'm, I'm happy to see that. You want to add something? Um, you know, talking about privatization of space travel, um, as I mentioned, Exquero Space wants to commercialize going into space. So now it means that if you have enough money, then you can buy your ticket to go to space, you know. And they did that also, NASA, they did that also with our very own Mark Shuttleworth. 2001, they took, uh, he had to pay to go to stay in, in the ISS for 10 days. So I think having these kind of privatization of companies taking people and commercializing going to space, it's a great idea and it's, the art of possibilities, you know, beyond planet Earth, you know, um, if you want to go to space, then you have to pay for your ticket. I see that as one of the giant leaps as human beings could do. To make it all more accessible. Exactly. To make everybody. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah, you have the, the two main domains in which commercial space travel is developing itself is uh, space tourism, which we all know about, and then space mining. Um, with space mining, there's a particular, because it's actually, actually interesting that you tie the resource discussion with what we heard today about energy. Energy and resources are so well connected. So one of the big problems that we will have in the future is when you have an asteroid, uh, when you have asteroid mining, there is so much money to be made with asteroid mining. The values of asteroids are astronomical, literally. Yeah. So um, what is going to happen is if companies are actually building infrastructure to mine asteroids, companies like Apple are going to be dwarfed financially. These companies are going to be massive. So you'll have companies that have, a, that have budgets that are dwarfing any budget on planet Earth, plus they have a territory which is outside of Earth. This is going to have huge repercussions for governance of our planet. Maybe we should, these companies are going to be hugely powerful. We should introduce the idea of the International Space Treaty, because maybe not everybody is familiar with it. Yes, yeah, so the international space law says that no government can claim a celestial resource. So how how are we going to handle that? American that's, Congress that's, already yeah, changed. It's going it. to be the Wild Wild West, apparently, first come, first serve. So yeah, the, the space law says you can't have property, but the American American Congress changed the law, I think, last year or yeah, this year, the bill, in yeah. which they said that if you extract something, you can actually do whatever you want with it. Yeah. So it's it's the moon is not your property, but anything you take out of the moon actually becomes your product. So it's an interesting way how it, they're bypassing this law. It's to allow private companies to invest it, like. to advance this. Yeah. It's, it's to allow private companies simply to, to engage in these kind of things. Huh? Uh, but, <clears throat> yeah, I think it also will create quite a lot of jobs in telerobotics. It will, you know, advance the, these kind of things. So it will open up a whole new industry and people will engage in a totally new way with space, even from here. Um, but one of the, I think, also big questions is, uh, are we going to reboot, you know, the way we mine really profoundly, or are we going to apply the same technologies as we do here, you know? And and Angel is a biologist, so he's really well placed to 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 discuss this in more detail. But there are a lot of, uh, uh, um, um, you know, you can go into geomicrobiology, and there are, I think, the, the CH13, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember the name completely anymore. But there are certain kind of bacteries that really extract the ore and certain ores and, you know, out of mineral, uh, out of rocks. I mean, this is really amazing. It's doing it naturally. So imagine, I can imagine an asteroid, you know, fly by, you know, every 10 years, and after 10 years, you know, jump on it, and, you know, the ore is extracted. You just have to wait. I mean, 
mean, these are really profoundly new things that we can anticipate on and work with and use time as an advantage, mm -hmm. you know? But anyway. um, yeah, so let's take some questions from the audience. Does anybody have? There's microphones coming to you from the stage. <laughs> We're going to need that back. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah, um, I, I, well, um, Karen, I just wanted to say sort of thank you for saying what I was about to say, which was about the fact that we're going to other planets when we've got so many damn problems over here. And it's great that, um, Mandela, you, you can be the first South African to go into space. It's respect to you for that. But as you well know, not just in South Africa, but all the other rest of the one billion people in Africa, we can't even solve poverty pe for the people over there. We can't even solve the problems for the people over there, whether it's in India or South Africa or anywhere. And you know the problems. There's not enough water. There's not enough resources. And now we're going into space where already there's a problem with very quite a few com uh, companies going into space, and there is the problem of junk waste in space. And a lot of people already said that when the electrics for that starts to fail, or if there's not enough pro uh, energy provided, those things can fall out of space. But fundamentally, um, I'm like thinking, have we already solved the problems on this planet? And we're, we're just this is just escapism? Um, because we've got a million and one problems over here. And also, the other thing is the full cost impact analysis of building these rockets for people to go into space. I mean, is that going to be digging up Africa all over again to get the sensors? This is like, whoa, this is madness, you know? Um, where's the sustainability in this? We're all like, you know. <laughs> go I'll for give it. You, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the microphone, but I also want to make a comment on that. Because Thank you very much. Look, um, I'll answer in terms of uh, South Africa or Africa as a whole. People have this perception that African, African children are hungry, and of which is not true. You know, we've got UN, which is in place that is feeding other African countries. You know, we know now we are in peace times. So part of the mission in our South African Air Force, our defense force, is to make sure that we maintain those peace times. So people have this perception that African children are hungry for food, of which is not true. I say they are hungry for knowledge. And things like space exploration, space travel, I did mention that these endeavors that break limits are the things that are going to inspire kids that any dream can come true through hard work and determination. That is my answer to you. Um, yep. There's so there, there's one thing. I agree and I disagree with you. One thing is that um, the whole economy that we live in right now, it's pretty much based on scarcity and in fear. That's what drives the whole entire economy today. I agree with you there's a lot of problems in this earth, but I'll tell you, this earth has never seen such a great times ever, the humans. There's been less wars. There's been you know less people dying out of hunger. Less wars, yeah, yes, for sure. No, 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 really, there's less wars. So there's no invasions? No, there, is, there, 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 are, there are wars, but if you look at the numbers, just a century ago, there's a lot less wars than today. I mean, than 100 years ago, or even 50 years ago. Yeah. If I can make a comment from the continent point of view, I think we've seen the world problems are always uh, blamed on Africa, but yet Africa is not creating the problems. And I think the space exploration being centered around African continent will also allow Africa to, to own its own resources. We, we, I think we as Africans are tired of everyone invading our space, but yet we don't have the capacity and the knowledge to, to, to do things on our own. So I think we, I'm not underestimating the problem that we have as a nation or as a continent, but I think in the midst of that, 
the sooner Africans can also be at the same par as the world, the better for themselves to be able to empower the, the rest of the generations. So I think the, the positive here is how do we use this opportunity to actually empower young African children to be at the same level as the rest of the world? And, and the last one that I just want to make a comment, like Manla said, like, you know, it's hungry for hunger. I mean, uh, hungry for knowledge. Yes, I mean knowledge, but, you know, the wisdom is also important to apply to the, to the knowledge. And the wisdom you get from the universe, you don't get it from the people. So. <laughs> oh, the microphone here. Do we have another question? Another um, question? Gentlemen. Uh, yes. Etienne? Yes. Okay. All right, I'll and run the microphone. And then there's someone two thirds of the way back as well. I have a nasty question. Nasty? Yes. Like, over decades, if I read the history books and if I see museums, art has always been, I mean, popular art, to be known, has always been sponsored by big money. See the churches. Over years, over decades, art, you see only religious art. Then since Renaissance, we see other type of art. Now, my question is, um, big companies like, like the space mining organizations, uh, there are about two on the world, as far as I know, with a lot of money. And I have no idea what's behind it. Are they sponsoring you f with secret projects <laughs> like they did in the Renaissance <laughs> or no? What are we going to say? I don't even want to say it, right? <laughs> Spill the beans, guys. <laughs> no, I think, I think I'm personally, I'm just like a, a little kid, you know, interested in these kind of things. And I want to push, you know, myself and challenge also society to think with me, you know, how we can advance these kind of things. Uh, implementing also ethics, the holistic point of view, all these kind of things, because it's fun, but it's also pretty complex. And it's not something that one person can deal with. It's a story about all of us, and even your children, and the children after your children. So that's what we appeal to. We don't appeal, at least in my case, to these two companies, which one, is them, uh, one of them is in, in Luxembourg, Luxembourg, by the way. Um, no, I never had contact with them. But you know which money is behind? Because they're like, like quite sick. I have no idea. <laughs> <We're talking backstage. laughs> um, yeah, well. Sorry, there was another question back there, the gentleman in white. Oh, she has a microphone. Yeah. Uh, to your right there and left. Well, uh, first, thank you. Um, as an engineer, I'd like to disrupt. Like, um, from what I've seen, I'm now wondering if there is an ethical limit uh, to what you're doing. It kind of seems like the first question, but uh, to me, to, for example, building a temple or even any building on the moon right now seems like a huge waste. So uh, what's your point? Where is the limit? What you got from my presentation is that it's important to build a temple on the moon today. Um, um, I did a really bad job because that, that wasn't really the point at all. Uh, art is not really necessary in terms of we don't need to build it. But, uh, you know, I feel you as an engineer and I understand, but if you apply that rule to everything, then why come in here today to come to a conference, you know, or why listen to rock and roll? Or why, you know, if you, if you start with that kind of a negative perspective, you know, I, I could, you know, start questioning many, many of the things that made us happy today. And for many people, you know, they find art valuable. I'm not trying to say that everybody should dig it, but you know, that's a, a part of my work is to create some sort of future scenario. And that future scenario is, you know, a big part of it is fictional. But I can believe that it can have a very positive social impact today. And that's what I'm trying to do with my work. Uh, I'm not, I didn't start to build a temple yet, you know. Uh, I mean, don't worry about it. But, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I won't ask you for... Uh, Crowdsourcing, the <laughs> so I, crowdfunding. Then <laughs> I can I can also add a little bit uh, to that because I've, I've done the um, the Mars simulation, and the thing is when you're living together and you know I haven't been living on Mars, nobody has, but we simulated it. But the thing is, you're not just robots that are trying to stay alive for four months and then you come out, you make your reports, and the job is over. I mean, daily life with a small crew is a combination, of course, of engineering, of scientific problems, of troubleshooting and of culture. 
the whole experience is heavily cultural. There's no way I would really recommend you to do an isolation mission. Maybe uh, sign up for MDRS in Utah and experience it. So, and it, this comes up in all kinds of ways. It comes up in the kind of preferences that people have in food and the importance of food and how much people people talk about food. Two, two times a, uh, a week we had movie nights and one of our crew members would choose a movie, would introduce it to the other people and then we would share it and we'd discuss it. So culture is inherently a part of space exploration. Even for the astronauts that are, that are working in the International Space Station, culture is embedded in many, many different things. So that's how I look at the temple idea. It's not so much as the realistic temple, it's more questioning uh, what it means to live outside of this earth and what we needs to lead a real human life. But the reverse is also true, right? Because when you're imagining a future scenario, you're also doing research that can be implemented once we do get to Mars, or if we need to live in the Utah desert, we need to find a way to grow food in the Utah desert. Your Black is Black um, project, the, the black material is actually used to coat the insides of telescopes, is that correct? So these have pragmatic applications right now and for the future. So there's that as well. Yeah. I just think that you know the future will be a mix of you know scientific research or doing purely science on the moon, like building a, a, a lunar liquid mirror telescope on the moon, for example. There will be uh, also you know a lot of business in it. The companies we're talking about, the mining, the natural resources. So I think it wouldn't hurt to add a bit more of a human perspective into this whole mix, because we we've seen what happened before and it's not pretty at all. So. Let's try to do a better job. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Just, just one thing, because I, my mind keeps... keeps sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm talking again, I know. Um, but the, question, the critical perspective on space exploration, it's a big thing. It always comes up in any presentation about space exploration. Some people are questioning, for very good reasons, why spend money while Earth is going down the drain. Um, I would be very unhappy if we would not address Earth, the problems on Earth, and only start investing in space full on. Of course, that's totally not what I want. But you've got to be really careful when you're talking about space exploration. Space exploration is a very diverse world. India has a space program that has been heavily criticized. The reason that India built a space, uh, a sp a space infrastructure, one of the main reasons, not the only reason, is that it could uh, survey crops, resources, water management, which right now farmers in India can access through their cell phones. This is directly applicable to the daily lives of Indian people. This is not some, some waste of money and some expensive rocket that is being flown just for the prestige. But of course, human space flights, Human space flight, that's something you can discuss because that's expensive and I totally agree. And that's something we need, we need to discuss and we can have an ethical discussion about, of course. But then we should discuss military budgets. Yeah, I just wanted to say the same with the military. How much money we're spending? Oh, sorry. No, no. No, then I was saying let's discuss military budgets. Let's discuss, you know, how we spend our money from our governments. And, you know, this discussion can go on forever. Yeah. Totally. And if you see what actually, I'm also not a military fan or something, but when you need them, you know, you're happy in a way, right? Even if it's a catastrophe or, you know, it's not per se for war. But if you see through the history of, 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 of the military, a lot of technological advances were made at this, you know, in there and still, you know. And uh, for instance, the microwave, you know, you wouldn't have a microwave without, you know, advances in, in military. It's that simple as that. The same for investing into space and uh, space technologies and space whatever it is to do with space I mean just the same yeah. do we have any other questions we have about two minutes left so um, I see a hand hi there um, I came a bit late so excuse me but I have a question um, totally not related to what you guys are saying but um, is there any uh, sound engineer slash musician in your team I'm a concert cellist, so I know the world uh, <laughs> hums in B flat, and I know that actually the stars uh, make a, a very uh, cool kind of music. If you really, you know, and this is from actually space exploration. I just wanted to know, just curious, if it, there's anyone there, like music is sound there, engineer is, slash. Is there a role for music in space, guys? Well, my younger brother Valerie Vermeulen has a specific project on doing um, performances of electronic music which are exclusively made using signals from outer space. I can, right. I can give you the details later. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Anything else? 
Any last words from you guys? Yeah, um, oh. Any ideas on how to clean up space junk and perhaps turning it into art or something? <laughs> First you have to find it. <laughs> no, space junk is not that easy to find. It's, it is quite, it is still very dilute. I mean, of course, if you look at it on a small diagram where the Earth is this small and you give it, you pinpoint it, it looks very dense, but it's still relatively difficult, uh, difficult to find it. Now, um, there are a lot of governments that are really interested in developing technology to remove space debris because it's in their own interest. Nobody wants to send up an expensive satellite and get it damaged by some stupid bolt that is flying around the earth with a high speed and just uh, penetrates the, the the vehicle so there is there are efforts being done turning it into art well you know let's talk <laughs> great oh one more actually just sending through the atmosphere let it burn and you have like imagine uh, i mean incredible fireworks that would be the best artwork i guess <laughs> yeah i wanted to mention that um i was watching some program on national geographic so they had an idea of how to clean uh, space. Um, basically, what happens is that this machine will collect all the debris and then basically throw it back to Earth. So it will burn off while it's coming back to Earth. That's how they're planning to do um, how to clean up space debris. <laughs> yes, that's why. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we're done. Thank you all very, very much for speaking to us. This is awesome. Really good. Yay.